Good evening. This is the Wine of Life podcast, and today we're going to talk about the issues, uh, the more issues surrounding the Southern Baptist Convention, whether or not the Southern Baptist Convention will continue to exist as such. Some have said that it will not anymore. Some have said it will just be the end of the executive committee. But um, last week, um, the executive committee, because of a vote from the uh, messengers in uh, at the annual convention in Nashville this past year, I think it was in June or July, they voted that an investigation into the executive committee regarding the uh, cover-up sexual abuse uh, happened, that a third party do it, not someone that the executive committee chooses. And so, uh, after three votes, after however long it's been, I mean, ever months, and then three votes um, and some people resigning, uh, the executive committee decided to waive privilege, uh, which has led to their... Uh, law firm who represents them quitting, and uh, people are saying that the insurance will also drop them, but I'm reading this from the uh, Pathway uh, press outlet. It says, an independent third-party review of the SBC's executive committee is underway, according to Bruce Frank, chair of the SBC Sexual Abuse Task Force. Frank said the contract among the task force, Guidepost Solutions, and Roland Slade on behalf of the executive committee has been signed. The full report from Guidepost Investigation will be released 30 days prior to the 2022 uh, SBC annual meeting in Anaheim, California next June. So members of the EC agreed to waive attorney-client privilege at a special called meeting October 5th. The motion called for the waiving of privilege for an investigation into any allegations of abuse, mishandling of abuse, mistreatment of victims, a pattern of intimidation of victims or advocates, and resistance to sexual abuse reform initiatives. The investigation will look into the actions and decisions of staff members and of staff and members of the executive committee from January 1st, 2000 to June 14th, 2021. So that's going to cover a lot of time, you know, 20 years worth. And um, but why there were some issues with this? For one, if the uh, attorney client privilege was waived, why people were against it, uh, they were saying that that would mean that the only way they could pay for the lawsuits that would come in would be through the cooperative program. And the cooperative program is the money that all of the SBC churches give to go out to missions. So that money is given for the sake of the gospel. So we find this in, in the book of Acts. We find it in places like Philippians, Philippians 4, uh, where churches uh, give money to people who are out in the mission field. So Philipp, the church at Philippi was giving to Paul. Um, various churches helped the church at Judah when a famine came. So uh, there, there's a biblical precedent of why we had the convention, and that is a cooperation of the various Southern Baptist churches to help get the gospel out. Uh since the insurance will be dropped, that money will now be going to uh, lawyers. It will be going. It's going to lawyers anyway. It's been misused for a long time, anyways. Uh, but it's going to go to lawyers. It's going to go to people who uh, are victims or people who are claiming to be victims. All of this is uh, all happening. So the way that uh, they, the, the the executive committee who was against waiving privilege, framed it was that this will be the end of the SBC, that all of the cooperative program will be sucked out by these lawsuits and it won't be able to function anymore. And uh, so they were saying, people like Joe Knott and others were saying that uh, we can do the investigation without destroying the convention. Now, some of the, I, some of the quotes came out were pretty bad. <laughs> they looked really bad. Um, it made it look like they wanted to save a man-made institution rather than help these victims. Now, some people are saying they're not victims. Some of it are saying that um, the executive committee, for instance, has not been, any bone of them have not been accused of sexual abuse, that they're, what they're being accused of is the things that I read here, mishandling all of the claims. Now, some people would say that the claims themselves are actually adulterous affairs that happened and, the, and some of the women are claiming abuse. Um, we'll have to wait and see what the investigation shows. Who knows about all this stuff? Um, 
And then there's things like intimidation of victims or advocates, which we know uh, what happened with uh, Jennifer Lyell, who ended up suing the Baptist Press, which is ran by the executive committee, and she won her lawsuit. Um, they lied about her and committed libel. So uh, there's it's all bad. All of it is is very, very bad. And then there's the resistance to sexual abuse reform initiatives. And this one, I think, is more controversial because um, we know that other entities within the SBC also refused uh, reform initiatives. And so that's another reason why people within the executive committee, some people are saying it's a, this is all a political stunt, which some of it may be, I don't know. But we know that other entities like the ERLC also refused uh, some of the reform initiatives put forward, like having a database uh, of sexual offenders so that, so that Southern Baptist churches can look at who these people are who are trying to apply for positions and so on. So, uh, but I don't know, the, the question is, what sort of justice can we give? Outside of money, uh, what sort of justice can be done for these people? And then, of course, um, in what way can we find out what the truth of this is? Because there's a, there's a line that's, it, lines are a little bit blurred about uh, who's being abused and who's not. So even in the uh, Jennifer Lyell case, she said that she had been abused, but she also said she had sinned. Uh, she said that she's not not guilty of, of something, of, of some sort of behavior, but she also said that she was abused. So there's these weird lines now that are sort of, um, uh, they're cultural. They're not re- something that you will necessarily explicitly find in Scripture. Um, so that's kind of... Uh, blurring the lines about what is abuse and what isn't abuse, and it's difficult for for some people to get through. So I don't know what what side of the line the investigation is going to end up on. I guess nobody does. Um, but one of the things that has been that has not been discussed. So I watched like John Harris's podcast with Russell Fuller, and Russell Fuller was at the I think Southern Seminary. He was a professor there. He's like far of the right side, you know, he'd be considered on the right, whatever the right is, he'd be considered on the right, and he considers other people on the left, and so on. Um, But even in his defense of the executive committee, he says, I don't want to be defending the executive committee, because people like Ronnie Floyd, they're on the take too. (laughs) So, uh, and this is the problem, I think, when we're looking at this stuff, uh, there's a lot of people saying this is some sort of left-wing witch hunt, uh, and, and things like that. But I think we need to look at it from a different perspective that this is, however it's happening, this is God judging uh, the whole of the of the Southern Baptist Convention and the churches, and that we need to uh, examine the way that we do things, who has authority, uh, how they wield that authority, uh, and we need to look at that and address some of these issues, because that's what's important to me, being at a Southern Baptist church, um, that we remain biblical. And a lot of the things that are going on, even if you said, well, this pastor, he didn't abuse this woman, and it's good that people aren't raping people, don't get me wrong, but he still have not committing adultery. So he should be removed from being the pastor. Uh, this, You know, the same with people, you know, sort of saying, well, they didn't cover up sexual abuse, but they're on the take. Well, they're taking bribes, and they're misusing tithe money. I mean, that's Judas Iscariot territory. That's what he does. He was a thief. So all these things are sins, and whatever way God is using uh, the thing that's happening now, it is judgment, and we're not really looking at that. We're looking at it like it's a side, like the, the, you know, the left is coming after the right, or the right's coming after the left, but it's really God revealing things, because if you remain in sin for X amount of time, uh, uh, you know, if you don't repent and then move away from that, uh, it's going to be revealed, and you, you're you going to have to deal with the consequences of it, and we're going to have to deal with the consequences. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Uh, maybe the whole of the SBC will just fall apart, and all the money will just go off to all sorts of different people. Uh, but if there are people on, on the take, if there are people covering up things, if there are people having adulterous affairs, they shouldn't be in authority. And so I want to look at the way that Scripture talks about um, how people in authority should behave. Uh, 
Now, number one, when we talk about anathematizing people, who has the authority to do that? The church has the authority to do that, and that <clears throat> that anathematizing is not just for some local church. It's for the totality of the church. So can the church, right, and we're not talking about how Bob's Baptist polity works. We're talking about what the church can do biblically. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 22. It says, The salutation of me, Paul, with my own hand. So he wrote this himself. He says, If any man loves not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So anathema here means to be accursed. So we can... Uh, know and discern whether or not people are loving the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's something here in um, Matthew 14 here. How do we know who loves Jesus Christ? Jesus tells us, he says, he that has my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my own father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. But Judas saith unto him, Not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? And Jesus answered and said, If a man loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. So, how do we know if people love the Lord? We know because of the way that they live. We know that they keep the commandments that Christ has laid down. So when we're looking at who is um, appropriate for ministry, right, we'll just look at something like bribes, right? Now there are judges and officers that were given to Israel in Deuteronomy 16. Uh, we look at Deuteronomy 16, 18 to 20. It says, Judges and officers, shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God gives thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. So these are people in authority over the other people of the tribes it says thou shalt not rest judgment thou shalt not respect persons neither take a gift that means a bribe for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous that which is altogether just shalt thou follow that thou mayest live and inherit the land which the lord thy god gives thee so people who are taking gifts should be disqualified from leadership uh, that's i think that's quite clear within scripture now we're talking about do we hold to the law or so on well christ fulfilled the law and obviously there are ceremonial aspects that we don't keep of the law and obviously we don't um, lay down the judgments that were placed in the law because we don't have that sort of civil authority as christians anyways but we do hold to the law we don't we still say that things like not committing adultery is a sin uh, we say that uh, idolatry is a sin all of these things we're laid down in the law. The law is holy, just, and right. We, what we claim is, is that we cannot keep the law, and that will then be enough for us to be saved. The works of the law does not justify us. We are justified by faith in Christ apart from the works of the law, according to Romans. But the things within the law, we, we ought to, the moral aspects of the law, we ought to keep. Right, So there are things um, with regards to the land that we don't keep because we don't live in the land. We don't have that covenant with God that Israel had. But the moral aspects of it, we do. We still tell people that adultery is a sin. So this is what Christ or God has revealed to us about rape in Deuteronomy 22, uh, 25. Uh, through 27 it says but if a man finds a betrothed damsel in the field and the man forces her and lies with her then the man only that lay with her shall die but unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing there is in the damsel no sin worthy of death for as when a man rises against his neighbor and slays him even so this is the matter for he found her in the field and the betrothed damsel cried and there was none to save her in other words rape is equal to murder it is the same as when a man rises up against his neighbor and slays him. That is what the matter is. And so rape is worthy of death, just as adultery is worthy of death, just as homosexuality is worthy of death. And so is someone who's involved in such an act capable of continuing to be in the ministry? Should they be disqualified? I think that that's a reasonable conclusion to reach. I don't see why that would be an issue. Um... But for some reason, uh, there are a lot of people who are 
supporting people who have abused or raped women. Um, there's a sort of protection going on. Now, with regards to children, this is what Christ says in Matthew 18. 18, 6 here, or 5 and 6, we'll read that. Whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receives me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believes in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. So it would be better if the death penalty were applied to people who offended little ones. Now, I think we would argue, he doesn't explicitly say, um, uh, talking about something like pedophilia, but I think we would, I think that's uh, fair to say that if you uh, did molest a child or you raped a child, that, that would turn them away from the church, that would turn them away from Christ because of the treatment that they went, that they were uh, exposed to by a pastor or leader within the church. And so should that disqualify from someone from the ministry? I think it's fair to say it is. And the problem is we don't have a way to enforce that. And so the question I would ask to people who listen to this, and I'd love you for you to comment, is what should we be doing something to change our polity as such? Um, not necessarily... Uh, hire people like uh, as bishops, but hire someone to say, this is what ought to happen. Uh, churches who hire these people in ministry, um, they are then outside of fellowship with us. They're outside of the faith. They have pastors who are not worthy of administering the sacraments and ordinances. They're not worthy of preaching the word. You know, I did a thing about sanctification recently, and part of that was teaching the word of God and the sacraments that are administered within the church, how can we have that when we have people who are seemingly are should be disqualified from leadership? Uh, should people who are taking bribes be uh, a part of an organization that distributes the money that comes in from the cooperative program? If someone like Ronnie Floyd is on the take, why is he part of the executive committee? The executive committee sends the money out. So, and that's not that that claim is not made from someone from the left or anything that was made by Russell Fuller. So it isn't a right left issue. Um, the issue is that this is damaging the witness of the church right now, and it needs to be settled quickly. It needs to be we there needs to be some mechanism that we have that we can um, enforce judgment. The church has to the right to anathematize people. Uh, the scriptures tell us that. I read it from 1 Corinthians 16.22. Uh, the church has the right to do that. We need to start doing... We need to be biblical. We need to make sure that people who are serving in leadership positions remain biblical. Now, you don't just support a man because you like a man or he's been nice to you or whatever. If he's done something that is unbiblical, doesn't mean that he can't repent and come and be part of the church again, but he can't serve or lead anymore. He can't do that because he, and we do this now, we do it with, um, you know, people who get divorced and remarried. There are a lot of churches, they won't hire the guy because he's been remarried. And we take that from the Bible, right? We take that from part of the qualifications, but also Christ saying that he who uh, marries one who's been divorced uh, commits adultery. So we, we don't hire those people. They still can be part of the church. And the same with these, they can still be part of the church, but they just can't serve and they can't lead if they're doing these things that compromise uh, their witness. So uh, let me know if you think what sort of changes we should have. Uh, these are difficult times. Um, it's really damaging the witness of Christ uh, by the behavior of the church as a whole. So pray for these uh, people. Pray that there will be some changes that happen quite quickly. And we will talk to you next time. Bye.